You know, uh, I've been an activist uh, for as long as I can remember. And even as a kid growing up uh, in Sydney, Australia, in my bedroom, I had this sense of uh, my own power to change the world around me, as Today you'll see here. Today we spoke to Jeremy Hymans at his Sydney home. Well, I think we have got problems, and I think we have got monetary problems. Uh, what you could do is divert 10% of each nation's annual military spending to services of debt, the environment and, you know, health, malnutrition, children and all these problems because we spend an excessive amount, an enormous amount on the military, which is completely uh, unnecessary to spend so much and instead we've got to spend that money on immediate problems, problems that uh, endanger our uh, entire society. <laughs> As you can see, I was a very unusual child. So, I, you know, I was a child activist. I traveled the world. I met Nobel Prize winners. I met world leaders. I campaigned on environmental issues uh, and many other uh, human rights and other causes. And uh, the weapon of my activism as a child was the mighty facts. This was, this was how I intended to change the world. I tried to stop the first Gulf War in 1991 armed only with the facts. I tried to stop nuclear war breaking out, armed only with the facts, and I, I take full credit for that. <laughs> but really, I was thwarted in my efforts because the, the facts had some serious bandwidth constraints. Uh, and I want to contrast that with a young woman who 25 years later uh, in Rio um, was taking her own approach, her own attempt to shape the world around her. This is Bia, and at age 11, a few years ago, she launched a campaign to try to save her school from being demolished to make way for an Olympic parking lot. This is happening all over Rio in the lead up to the World uh, Cup and to the Olympics. So Bia decided to take this into her own hands, and she started a campaign using this tool uh, called Pressure Cooker, which gave people a way to find out who the right decision maker was to target uh, if you wanted to launch a campaign, where in Brazil, it's very hard to know how to access power. So the campaign organization she did this with realized this could be an iconic impact story, a story of heroism that could inspire a bigger debate. So what they did was they, uh, they set up a website, they launched a live stream where they knew that the demolition of the school was imminent, they put a camera on the school and they invited the citizens of Rio to sign up and be text message guardians for the school. So they left their mobile phone numbers and the idea was that as soon as the demolition equipment, the bulldozers arrived, you'd get a text and then everybody would come to the school and form a human barrier to protect the school. Now, this campaign really captured the imagination of people in Rio. Thousands of people signed up to be text message guardians. And in the end, just 72 hours after the campaign was launched and a wave of media attention swept uh, Rio, the mayor of Rio had a change of heart. He said, you know what, we're not going to demolish the school after all. And he said that he would commit to more debates about these issues moving forward. So, you know, it's a small example, but, but, but two decades after my child activism, Bia was able to win, right? She was able to win a much bigger victory. And, you know, one can think through what the implications of this are. Is this a story simply of the facts uh, being less mighty than the mobile phone? And, you know, I would suggest that it's a much bigger story than that. And I got together with a colleague of mine who also builds movements, Henry Timms, and we started thinking, what's really going on here? How do we move beyond a debate that's just about the role of technology? And so we developed a framework that we first published at, in Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago, and I'm going to run you through that framework today, and I hope it helps to guide the discussions that we have as a group over the coming hours. Old power meet new power. So we see new power all around us, right? We see it in politics with uh, political actors, political movements that have no formal political apparatus, but that nonetheless sweep into power, take major, uh, you know, upend the establishment in ways that we didn't expect. We live in an era of rapidly increasing political dissent and unrest.
We see it in business where many platforms use this peer-to-peer -peer or mass participatory structure like Airbnb. Airbnb doesn't own a single square foot of real estate and yet it's now the largest source of temporary accommodation in the world. We're seeing it in finance where the oldest of old power intermediaries, uh, the bank, is being disintermediated by new models that allow people to coordinate their own power without those middlemen. So, you know, we can think of the difference between old and new power in this way. With old power, you know, you basically needed to think of it like a currency, right? The more you had of this currency, the more powerful you were. So your job was to kind of amass it, to hoard it. Now, with new power, you can't quite amass new power, right? You can't quite control it. It's something that you need to think of as a current, not a currency. So the people who are able to deploy new power are the people who know how to shape it and who know how to think of it as a current and let it flow. You can think of old power as something that is held by a few, but new power is something that is made by many, right? Imagine a Facebook with no people in it it would be an empty vessel. So these new power models are enabled by that capacity to amass people. Um, you could think of old power as, as download, right? So, you know, in the world of the economy, you bought the shoe. That was what we were asked to do, buy this shoe. In the world of media, you were asked to read this newspaper. In education, you were there to listen, right, and take in information, right? With new power, Upload is the kind of organizing principle, right? So all these models depend on what is uploaded from the bottom up. You can see how these principles then map across a series of dimensions. So here's what new power is not. New power is not your Facebook page, right? And what I mean by that is that lots of people are using these new tools and these new technologies in deeply old power ways. They're not fundamentally changing the way they actually engage with people. They're not pushing power down. They're not pushing power out into society. You know, Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad has a Facebook page. That does not mean he's embraced the power of participation, right? New power is also not inherently positive. It's important to understand that these tools of decentralized sideways power are being used by some of the worst actors in the world right now, like ISIS, to propagate their violence and their ideology, right? And on a more flippant note, there are lots of things for which the crowd is probably not ideally suited. I had the misfortune a couple of months ago of having a root canal surgery uh, on my teeth. And I assure you, I did not want that surgery to be crowdsourced. <laughs> New power is also not the inevitable victor. In fact, a defining feature of the age that we're in is this tug of war between the crowd, between unrest, between new forms of participation, and the rise of strongmen, who are in many ways uh, now stronger than ever, in part due to a backlash against some of these new power forces. But it's important to also remember that we're at the beginning of a very steep curve. So those Egyptian activists in Tahrir Square who were not able to consolidate that power ultimately and turn it into a lasting revolution, you know, in 10 years, those same activists may have different tools, may better be able to bring that kind of power together and consolidate it. And we must remember that these models are in their infancy. So uh, in the piece in Harvard Business Review, we sort of contrasted the values in the early 21st century that are kind of, in a sense, at loggerheads, old power and new power values. So think about this along a couple of dimensions, right? I was at the European Union a couple of days ago. And I'll tell you, the new power crowd would not have constructed the European Union set of institutions in the way that those institutions are organized, right? Those institutions are based on uh, formal, uh, more representative forms of governance, institutionalism, the 20th century ideology of managerialism, and new power values values in some ways eschew this, right? They favor networked governance, informal decision making. Now that doesn't make them better. In fact, imagine an EU without some of those formal protections and you could imagine a less fair, less just EU. You also see the tension between uh, radical transparency and kind of the values of privacy, discretion, separation between public and private sphere.
You saw that no more powerfully than in the recent presidential election in the US. You have the WikiLeaks ideology, which is radical transparency, no matter the consequences, even if we elect a, a racist and a bigot as president of the United States. And on the other hand, you have the Hillary Clinton ideology. In one of the speeches that was leaked, uh, she actually said, well, you know, it's important to have a private and a public position because she kind of represented that 20th century worldview that sometimes in order to get things done, you need that separation between public and private. So these are some of the big clashes of our time. So what we then did is we looked at new power and old power and we put it on a two by two matrix and we thought, you know, in terms of the models and the values, where do the, the great organizations and institutions of our day fit? You can think of Apple, right? Apple is the most valuable company in the world. And yet, even though it's a technology company, counterintuitively, it's really very old power as a company, right? Those product designers in Cupertino decide somewhere in, 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 that, in that untransparent place that none of us need a headphone jack anymore, right? And so that product descends upon us and tens of millions of people buy it that weekend, right? Um, it's a notoriously secretive organization, right? It's not really a new power organization. You could think of the contrast between the Obama campaign, right? The Obama campaign was all about new power, a huge participatory infrastructure of micro donors and volunteers eclipsed uh, many old power uh, political forces to elect Barack Obama president. But Barack Obama in office, although he did many good things, did not fundamentally change the way American presidents governed. He didn't really turn that crowd into a crowd that would help him govern into a more participatory way of running the country. And in some ways, that was a real challenge, right? Because ultimately those people didn't have the sense of empowerment that they may have needed uh, to show up in force uh, in 2016. Which brings me, of course, to Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump is a fascinating example of someone who uh, used these new power tactics, his mastery of the tools of allowing his, uh, his supporters to kind of amplify in a very extreme way his views, to make them their own. He really used this very decentralized techniques on social media to spread his campaign and message without a lot of formal political organization. On the other hand, his ideology, his great call, was an old power call, true and true, right? Where Barack Obama in 2008 said, we are the ones we've been waiting for, i.e., it's not about me. Donald Trump said, only I can fix it, right? And so you get these quite dangerous combinations of new power tools, people who know how to use them, but deeply old power values and propositions. So think about where your organization fits on this scheme. I want to talk to you for a moment about how to navigate this new power world. So uh, the first thing I'd say to you is if you're an old power organization or if you're a public official or leader, the most important thing to do is to occupy yourself before you yourself are occupied. Because the reality of our world today, and we've seen it time and time again, is that nothing anymore is something you're able to keep in a box, right? So you've got to imagine that your harshest critic is camped out in the heart of your organization, and you've got to ask yourself, do your actions and your values really line up? Because if they don't, you will be occupied. If you're a new power actor, you suddenly find yourself with an enormous crowd. And it's very different managing a crowd to having a bunch of employees on your payroll that you manage. You have a lot less control over that crowd. And I think the difference between Uber and Airbnb here is instructive. So Airbnb has really tried to cultivate its crowd. It's turned its hosts into an army of lobbyists in its regulatory battles. It's made them feel like they're part of a community. It's done that in a quite sophisticated way. Uber is much more transactional about how they're managing their crowd. They see their crowd as expendable. And now we're seeing, among other things, Uber's drivers actually begin to unionize against Uber, right? And these kinds of dynamics are gonna happen if you don't honor your new power base. In the realm of communication, I think it's really important to think about the difference between how you communicate in an old and new power world. In an old power world, if you were a spinmeister, your job was to develop the sound bite. It was one thing everybody said over and over again, rinse and repeat. 
In a new power world, sound bites don't travel very far. They don't travel sideways. So instead, what you need to do is a meme drop. A meme drop is developing language, developing images and other assets that you essentially drop on the crowd and allow them very intentionally to adapt that, to not repeat the soundbite, but to make it their own, to make it extensible. And Occupy Wall Street and Black Lives Matter, two of the social movements that have spread the furthest in recent years, are both essentially meme drops, right? They're ownerless. No one's running the show, but people are taking the idea and the inspiration and adapting it and owning it themselves. So in the context of the fight against ISIS, an organization that is using new power um, to spread its ideology, you know, we really need to think about how to fight new power with new power, right? You know, it's not enough, as the US government has been doing, to literally do airdrops, dropping leaflets on civilian populations telling them not to join ISIS, when ISIS is using meme drops to recruit people in a sideways manner. The US government thought it was getting sophisticated uh, when it created a social media platform uh, designed to discourage potential ISIS recruits called Think Again, Turn Away. But it chose the seal of the US State Department as its Twitter uh, uh, handle. Now, if you were a possible jihadist, do you think that would be the most persuasive voice to reach you? You know, you've also got to think about how you lead in a new power world. And somewhat counterintuitively, the leader of one of the most old power institutions in history, the Catholic Church, is actually exhibiting a lot of those new power skills. Remember the kind of new power signaling that Pope Francis did as soon as he, uh, he ascended to the papacy. Instead of uh, wearing those fancy robes, he took them off. Instead of getting in that fancy Pope mobile, he chose a beat up car. Instead of speaking from on high, he kissed the feet of the most vulnerable people. Pope Francis's challenge now is to take that signaling and turn it into structure. Can he structure for participation? Can he meaningfully push power down and out? Um, or will he just be a new power symbol? That's the big challenge for new power leaders. And finally, it's incredibly important that the platforms themselves, platforms like Facebook that have given us so much agency, this sense of participation and connection, but who've actually in many ways turned us into you know, animals on a participation farm, right? We have no decision-making rights. We have no real ownership of our data. We have no share in the mil billions of dollars of value being created, and yet, you know, our views are being manipulated and amplified and made more extreme by these platforms. So in a new power world, we, right, the crowds that make new power possible, must reclaim power from those platforms who've turned out to be very concentrating in the power they've created. I want to leave you with something that I hope is inspiring, which is that I think the most important thing we can do, and this is something that doesn't just apply to Silicon Valley billionaires, though it definitely applies to them, is to use this power we have, right? Many of the people here in the room understand how to mobilize a crowd. How do you use that power to actually uh, help and, and, and assist with the challenges of the, of the least powerful? This is a group in Syria called the White Helmets, who volunteer to rescue people in the most dangerous circumstances in the world in Syria. And I want to show you this video and then talk about how they've used new power. في أحد الأيام تعرضت منطقة الأنصاري لقصف بالبراميل المتفجرة. حسنا نطالع العائلة الأولى والعائلة الثانية. العائلة الثالثة هي الأم والولد. هي فعلا يعني الأم كانت كتير من فعلة. عندها كتير كانت عصبية وكانت عم تصيح يعني هي خايفة على حالة أو خايفة على أبناء. بعد الحفل الطويل حسنا نسمع صوت الولد صوت صار يبكي الولد حسنا نسمع صوته وكان كتير من حال صعب. بعد ما وصلنا لبلد هون صار الشغل كتير بده حذر يعني هذا ولد عمره أسبوعين أو أكثر بأي لحظة بيطب شيفه أو بيموت أو بختلي خلاطنا على الساعة طبعا هي ما يكلت من أرض يعني عمل كتير حذر يعني هاي روح بدك تعامل معه بشكل خطير جدا يعني إنه طفل عمره أسبوعين يطب فوق برميل أو ثلاث سقوف ما يستيبوشي يعني وكل هالضغوطات 
وانه هذا الطفل يطلع اقوى من البراميل واقوى من السقوف واقوى من كل شيء ما عندنا وقت قال لي قصف 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 So the bombing doesn't stop, and uh, that heroic man who pulled that baby out of the rubble died in a barrel bombing attack just a couple of months ago. But the baby lives. This is him now uh, at uh, age three, um, a sign of hope. A movement has grown up around the world in support of the White Helmets, a new power movement that's crowdfunding their work, that's really supporting what they do. And so I want to leave you with this critical question. How are you using new power to help the least powerful people in the world? That's what we've got to do. This capacity to mobilize millions and billions of people is an incredible gift, but we've got to do it in a way that serves the least powerful. Thank you so much.